And this morning, you know, over the last few weeks, with hard to obviously being away and so forth, tried to pretty hard to get you to understand who you are, who God has made you to be. Remind us all that we are the king's kids and just remember who we are and sometimes it doesn't feel that way. We feel pretty down about ourselves and sometimes we, you know, don't quite see what God sees in us and or each other. I encourage you to go watch that movie, The Shack, which I will stand by, recognizing there are those who may not like it, feel I shouldn't have said that. But quite frankly, church, I'm after something in the days ahead and I'm not really interested in the little attitudes of the past. The judgmental spirits can go somewhere else. This house is moving forward. We are growing in God. And I, I think all of us have the same feeling. We're, we're tired of just, you know, whatever. We're tired of talking church, talking love, whatever. We're going to do it. You know, this church has stood for breaking down the walls. We're breaking them now. Okay, we're going after it now. We're pushing to another level. And I appreciate that very much. So we don't have to agree with everyone or everything in this world to find beauty in it. Amen? But in that, I was headed down a road here in preparation. I spent a lot of time. I read the entire history of the Declaration of Independence. It's long. I spent many hours reading that, seeing if there was something directly in there and picked up a few things, but God began to just kind of whisper into my heart and just begin to, to speak these words to encourage you, which is the message of this day that Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's one thing to understand who you are in him, but then you shift to an understanding of who he is in you. And Christ in us is that hope of glory. You know, it is interesting, though, relating to our history. 241 years ago, on the 4th of July in 1776, we think somehow, and you know, I don't know how well they are teaching history anymore. I think it's easy just to say everything is horrible in the public schools, and I say, I don't know that. I think there's some great teachers, some great schools, and some that aren't. But I hope that you are studying our history and knowing where we came from, both biblically as well as as a nation. But, you know, we have this image in our mind that these guys just got together, busted up, you know, some Starbucks and wrote this document and signed it. But when you go and look at history, it was written by an incredibly flawed group of men. We call them founding fathers. There's another word I found in history that's used to describe them, which you call frenemies, founding enemies. They were friends and enemies. Sometimes they fought each other tooth and nail. Sometimes they work together. You talk about political elections, my God, you should have seen some of the stuff these guys went through. John Adams and Jefferson, who were dear friends in one way and bitter enemies in another. It's just interesting to follow the history, and I'm making a point, how God used flawed vessels. You know, sometimes when you're a student of history and you enjoy history, which was my favorite subject, you know, we, we kind of idolize in a certain way, and we, we almost kind of fantasize and idolize in a way that may not be as healthy as it ought to be. You see, we don't need to idolize to honor. We don't need people to be perfect for us to admire. Because the truth of the matter is, everything that has ever been done on planet Earth of any significance outside of Jesus Christ came through the flaws of men. And I'll tell you who the biggest critics are. They're the ones who sit in audiences and do nothing. Because when you do something, despite your flaw, you will understand what I'm talking about right now. You will understand how quickly people will line up to pick out your blemishes. How easy it is to pick out the stuff in you that's not right. Keep on doing it, baby. 
Keep on building it. Keep on doing it. Keep on moving forward. The critics can line up and go straight to wherever they want to go, but we're going forward. Why? Because Christ in me, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Try to do this mess on our own. you got to be kidding. You can't even be married on your own. You better have some Jesus in you. And I'm telling you right now, if you're in the market right now, you better look for some Jesus in Jose and Hector and all them girls that you're looking at. You better find some of that. You better find some tithing in their life, and you better find some, some praise and worship in their life. You better see a servant in them. You better see someone that lifts the arms up of their leadership and doesn't pull them down over at lunch. You better find somebody with honor and integrity, somebody who, who looks out for other people. You better look for the right thing if you want a long term. Okay? And this is all free stuff. This isn't my message. That's free stuff. Our wonderful founding fathers were an amazing collection of, of individuals. Jefferson, Adams, Adam, uh, John Hancock, you can go on and on and on. Brought together 13 colonies, Virginia, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey somehow, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, North and South Carolina, and Georgia. The 13 original ones. Adams used to gossip about Jefferson. He used to gossip about Jefferson who had a slave love affair with a woman named Sally Hemings. They produced from one to six children. Did you know that? Their lineage is still living today. And Jefferson, Adams used to just, he used to just sow stuff out there and, and little by little the media got a hold of it and became public and God forbid now that we, and you know what, thank God that history had enough sense to remember the good that Mr. Jefferson did over the negative. Did you know he had thousands of slaves and wrote a document that said all men are created equal? How'd that happen? Oh, you don't know what I'm talking about? We hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, they're obvious. That all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable, God-given, irrevocable, and absolute rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thousand slaves. But still... God is on the move through flawed individuals planting seed for the future. It would have been easy to just pull the man down, judge and criticize. But God was not looking at just the moment. He was looking at today. He was looking at tomorrow. He was looking at progress. He was looking at the glory to glory principle, you see. And that's why sometimes when you look at yourself and young people, don't freak out that you're not so perfect yet. Because one day you'll be as perfect as us, and then you'll go, oh my God, I got so much work to do. You see, the critic wants to look and say, you're disqualified, man, because you're not this, you're not that, you're not as good, whatever. But God doesn't see it that way. God sees today where we're sitting together in a room, black and white and brown and yellow and whatever we are, sitting here worshiping God freely. So I don't need to turn history into some sort of agenda thing. I just need to look at it honestly and rejoice and marvel at how God used these extraordinary Extraordinary people. Such faith, such drive. Listen to their words. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, we solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all pol political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, we serve 
God. They honored God in a way that's hard for us because when we want to look and criticize, we cannot see them honoring God. We only see them as hypocrites. And so there's a movement in America to tear these individuals down so we have no honor left. Tear everything down. Tear the presidents down. Tear leaders down. Tear everything of authority. Tear the preachers down. They're flawed. They're shams. They're, they're, they're whatever. Tear fathers down. Make them look like losers. Tear everything down. Can you imagine if people in your life just let you grow instead of letting you go? Can you imagine the kind of relationships we would have if people would walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death? And that's why I'm telling you about my Jesus. Because he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Now, let me ask you a question right now. Just use your intellect right now with me. If the master of the universe, the perfect one of God, the one who is God, won't leave me, regardless of all the stuff y'all don't like, Who gave you authority to do? Who gave you the right to judge me? This isn't personal. I'm trying to just use me as an example. But we're all really in this thing, right? Who gave us that right? Who gave us the right to judge any of these things? When President Obama was in office, people said, he's not a Christian. You have no right to judge that. You have no idea where his soul is. And you have no idea where Mr. Trump's soul is either. We have to learn how to grow up in this house and respect and honor, recognizing that if it's just a little seed, it may grow beyond their office. It may grow in their office. What I do know is that I marvel, as you must, at how much God can use us in our own weakness. If you haven't marveled, then I would invite you to start marveling by doing something. It's a wonderful place up here in the thin air of obedience. And in that place, there is a magnificent safety net for our disobedience. It's called God's grace. Lord, I want to beat myself up. He says, stop that before I whoop up on you. I'm not beating you. Who are you to beat yourself? I'm talking freedom here today, folks. I'm talking freedom. And when you start getting this stuff, all of a sudden, you change. and you know what? Let me tell you something. I, where are you? Where are you? Because I know someone's in here going to run out here and say, Bishop, Bishop's gone liberal. Bishop ain't preaching the gospel anymore. He used to preach a strong gospel. That was a man. That was a lion of God. Now he's just talking about all love and mercy. Talking about homosexuals aren't going directly to hell. Who's us to judge? All this stuff. I know you're out there. <laughs> but I love you too. I love you too. I have to. It's a rule. It's a rule. And he said, love never fails, man. Love's powerful. It's incredible. Did you know, just a little history, did you know these two rascals, Adams and Jefferson, went at it for all these years? And do you know that on July 4th, 1826, on the 4th of July, they both died on the same day in separate locations, 50 years after they signed the Declaration. Did you all know that? That's why you come to Kingdom Life. <laughs> Learn stuff. <laughs> but isn't that cool? I don't know. Okay, there are coincidences, I get that. But mathematically, the odds of two men of that age dying on the same day, and it happens to be July 4th, I tried to look up the odds, can you believe that? 
I tried to calculate, that didn't work, so I figured I'd get to someone smarter than me, and they said it was beyond calculation. It was in the hundreds of millions to one that that could possibly happen. Whether that's true or not, mathematically, it is unbelievable in one sense, except God. That God somehow wants to have a say and say, y'all ended up in the right place because they ended up as friends. Because you know what? When you go through battles like these guys went through, you might go at it with each other, but when it's all said and done, there's something about your adversary that you feel closer to than anyone else. Sometimes when you stick that marriage out, you work that thing through, you go through stuff, there's something about that year that you look at each other and say, baby, <laughs> if he didn't take us out by now, he's not going to get us. What we've been through, you can't make it up. And he has sustained us. And God wanted to kind of say, well done, good and faithful servants. You fought together, you die together. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we live together, if we fight together, and if we die together? The spirit of division moving throughout our nation, trying desperately to inject cracks, trying to use old arguments for new results, trying to split us and separate us and divide us. If he can't get the ethnic thing, the racial thing, the, 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 the immigration thing, if it's not that, it's the Democrat thing, the, the Republican thing. If it's not that, it's the religious thing. If it's not that, it's the gay thing. He's constantly trying to shred us. I see him like an angry, like an angry animal with his teeth out trying to rip us apart, and it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Why? Because Christ is in us, and that is the hope of glory. Not our genius, our education, not our beauty, not our, our finances, but the Christ that is in us. That's the hope of glory. Let me just read you some scripture here. Go to John chapter 14, if you would. John chapter 14. <clears throat> and if I read faster than you can catch up, please know you can get these online and also write them down. I would encourage you to go home and study these scriptures as well and make them your own. If you love me, verse 15, chapter 14, if you love me, you will obey what I command and I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter, another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives what? Read it. He lives with you, but here's what I'm after. And he will be what? In you. He will be in you. Colossians 1.27, most of you know this, but if you're new here, this is one of those scriptures you want to memorize. You want to learn forever. Chapter 1. Paul says in verse 24, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its, the church's, servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. And now that we know that's us, it's a word for us. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. What is this? What is this magnificent subject that Christ in you is the only hope of glory on the earth? 
so profound, so powerful. Throughout the Bible, how many times do we see? Time and time and time again. If you really want to have a good laugh one day, you'll go to Exodus chapter 3, you'll find Moses. And God comes to Moses, who's, by the way, still wanted for murder in Egypt. There's an APB out on him. And I don't think there's any limitation on murder, so maybe there wasn't any there back then. Probably not. But God comes to him. He's wandered away from the things of God. He's out in the wilderness carving out a new life for himself. And God comes along, and how you doing, Moses? Fine. I'm doing pretty good. Wow. That brush is burning. Is that you? Is that what you look like? Nah, just doing that to be able to talk with you, you know? And how's things going? Well, you know, it's fine. It's not Pharaoh's house, but everything's okay. I've worked things out. Really, how is that working out for you? Well, truth be told, I don't know. I think there's more to me than this. But I don't know. What do you think? Well, now that you bring it up, I have a mission for you. For I've called you. I want you to do something that's going to represent me back in Egypt. Whoa. Do you understand that I'm wanted there? They've all died. What else? Um, Moses said to God in verse 11, chapter 3, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? You see, he didn't know who he was either. We talk about Moses like, oh, Moses. But Moses started out not having any clue who he was. Who am I? Excuse number one. I'm not worthy. I'm not qualified. My goodness, the Bible says the rocks will cry out and praise God. He'll use a donkey to speak. If he can do that, who am I? That's not the issue. And then God said, but I will be with you. It's not all about you, Moses. Not everything is about you. Sometimes, really, we got to stop making every single thing about us. Settle the fact that you're a child of God, man, and spend most of your energy focusing on what God wants to do through you, not just to you. I mean, counseling is great, but at some point, pay the bill and move on. Get to work. You'll find more healing in doing than hearing after a while. He says, number two, verse 13, uh, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they say, what is your name? What should I tell them? It's so, okay. If you're saying I'm qualified and I'll go with you, you'll go with me. What if I do it? And they start asking me all these questions. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to them. I am has sent me to you. I think there was a tone. I'll prove it in a minute. He starts elevating the conversation. They go back and forth, and I won't read this all to you. Chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answers it. What if they do not believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord did not appear to you? And the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And he creates a miracle to let him know that all you need to know is that, A, I have called you, B, I am with you. C, go and just use what you got. And I will empower it. They go back and forth. Moses should have been blown away by this. It was pretty impressive. Moses comes back with number four in verse 10. He says, oh, Lord, I have never been eloquent. I, 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 I neither in the past... All of a sudden, all of a sudden, he's got brain damage. I see no documentation in any of the story of Moses prior to this that he had any issue. Maybe there was all along. But all of a sudden, 
It seems like some of us all of a sudden get amnesia. All of a sudden, we forget what we believe. We forget this, that, and the other. We forget those vows at the altar. He says, I, 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 I'm not really eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. I'm reading all of the conversation up to this and see no slowness of speech or tongue in the conversation until now. And here's what the Lord said to him. Give me some tone. Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I? Now go, and I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> and then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he's about done debating. Thank you. <laughs> I say there was a tone beginning to develop in God because sometimes God must get a little bit annoyed with us when he's calling us, equipping us, sending us, giving us everything but a map and we're sitting there finding some reason why we can't do it. Well, I got news for you. You can't do it. But you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. I can't do all things. If I go on the roof and flap my wings, I will fall in that parking lot and make a stain. But if I do what God wants me to do, what he calls me to do, and Christ is in me, I can do it through Christ in me. That's why I'm standing here right now. Big old Marine teacher grabbed me by my hair when I was in class, ripped me out of my seat. He didn't know that when I was a little boy, I got picked to do a play and messed it all up and got humiliated. All the kids laughed. Well, you think that's not a big deal. I'm still getting counseling for it. <laughs> Move on, Bishop. He grabs me, puts me, put, lifts me up. Back in those days, you can abuse kids. And literally used me for about four minutes holding me up by my hair as an illustration of how not to behave in class. Then, make me get up and teach the rest of the class on the front, from the front, knowing I don't know what in the world he was talking about. What he didn't know was that I didn't have glasses and couldn't see the board. And we didn't have enough money to buy them, so I just basically went up after the class and wrote things down. But for years and years and years, I could not get up in front of people. I couldn't get, it terrified me. As an adult, as a grown man, it terrified me. Eastman Kodak Company spent $5,000 and sent me to a Dale Carnegie speaking class. I was too afraid to go train, let alone do it. I skipped the whole thing. My days ended there. <laughs> when I tell you Christ in me is the hope of glory, folks, I'm talking the truth. And that's why God loves finding unqualified people on one level so that they can't get up and boast about how slick or how good or how able they are. God wants people who have skills. You have the potential and you'd be amazed how much capacity God has placed within you. But it's got to be refined. And most of us don't venture into the refining process. We don't venture into that process. It develops our best. We stay based on some sort of a thing of daddy's voice or somebody's comment or a teacher's stupidity or whatever it might be in our self-image. God can do amazing things through you. And for years and years and years, I would tell people, I would say something, they'd look at me shocked. I would say, stop trying to be like Jesus. It's not going to work. They would look at me like, oh my God, heresy. And I would say, try a different approach. Because if you're trying to be like Jesus, man, he's perfect. You're not. You're going to always feel frustrated. But I got another strategy. What if you were to humble yourself and let Jesus live his life through you? 
And what if you did that by faith? Recognizing that in the process is going to be your own humanity, your own stupidity, your own big mouth, all of that stuff. But from time to time, the love of Jesus will come through you. The wisdom of God will flow into your mind. The joy of the Lord will become your strength and peace that passes understanding. God will help you to help others. And you will always know the difference between you and him in you. You will go to confront and you will feel overwhelmed by love. People started realizing, oh my God, it's so true. I can't have peace in the middle of a really bad, bad, bad situation. How am I going to do that, really? That sounds so churchy. That's great. You can't. Not on your own. You can play nice music and calm down. But the peace I'm talking about, it's Jesus' peace in you. His strength in you. His courage in you. You can't be kind because, well, this is the way I've always been. Well, then get born again. And when Jesus comes in, you become a new creation. And now all of a sudden, if you will allow it and humbly say, Lord, I really am not the best person in the world right now, but will you just help me love this person? Help me work with this person on the job. And you start to feel, by, it's got to be by faith. You're going to have to believe it. You're going to have to allow him. You're going to have to surrender. But what if he starts telling you, pray for the next month for that person? I can't do a thing in this situation until you do something it gives me access. And you start praying for that person. Do you know after 30 days it's really hard to hate someone you're praying for? And many of us have experienced the love of God working through us and moving through us. And this is how we see the Bible. My God, Samson, and so many characters in the Bible. Samson, what a character that was. David, you got to be kidding. Everybody, anybody read the Psalms? You know when you, you, you're supposed to read the Bible and you really just want to kind of get some Bible in there? And where do we go? Psalms, Proverbs. You're reading something of a guy who committed adultery but had the guy murdered on top of that. And he did a lot of other things. That's whose stuff you're reading. You're, you're reading Gospels about Jesus written by clowns who denied they even knew him, ran from him when he needed them the most. Two-thirds of the New Testament is written by a guy who made a living killing Christians. Try to imagine the women and the children running screaming as he's trying to order the soldiers to round them up and don't let one of them get away. Now he's writing these things we treasure. Saul, why do you persecute me? Do you have any idea who you are? But you can never really know who you are until you know who I am. And from that day forward, Christ in that man changed the world. And to this day, he's blessing us. Who are the qualified preachers? Oh, Jim Baker. He fell, and he went ever Jim Baker. I was telling him Wednesday night. I was there when Jim Baker got out of prison. I was at the service that he came to. I watched that little man. He's a tiny little guy. Come to church. Big moment, wearing little shorts and looking like a... And just crying, and all the ministers around him. He said how he was tormented when he was in prison by all the people that he blessed and gave money to and helped. They all abandoned him. Except the man who was hosting this, the, the event I was at. And he said, that's why I'm here. I feel safe here. And preachers started crying all over the room. They started crying. You know why? Because many of those preachers were the guys who, were, who had basically crucified him. They came up one by one and began to hug him, this little man, and all these pastors... Nine thousands, thousands of people, but all these pastors at the front were just hugging him and loving on him. He built something for God. He led hundreds of thousands to Christ, and so did Jimmy Swaggart. So do so many. Where did you hear T.D. Jakes got stuff? I, 
I will not accomplish a fraction of a tiny bit of what that man will accomplish on this earth. The other part is between him and God. Don't you know Dr. Martin Luther King had women? Don't you know he changed the world? You see, we have this tendency, and yet we can read the Bible that says these gifts are hidden in jars of clay. This beautiful thing that God has placed within us, designed to be a developing seed that those who have no insight will try to kill all along the way because it's not fully developed. Don't wait for it to grow. Rip it out of the ground. Why? I don't know. I just want to. Not realizing that it takes time. It takes effort. And maybe if the body of Christ had been there for these men in a proper way, it's possible they could have all been restored better. It's possible it could have been averted. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You see, there's such hypocrisy in the human experience. You see, you all look at me and you sit here, you come to this church and you listen to the man of God. If you were able to see the videotape of all of the dynamics of this man of God, most of you would stay home. And I'm not saying that to be falsely humble, I'm saying it as a fact. You would stay home. You would want to hear it because somehow in your mind, and even in the fact that you know that your own videotape is worse, but still something in you has bought into the illusion that if that thing is not somewhat near perfect, I cannot, and it doesn't exist. That illusion is what destroys marriages. That illusion is what destroys so many relationships. The unconditional love of God is the thing that God uses to be able to work through us. And through us, Moses was able to declare a declaration of independence and set the Israelites free. What did they do to him in the wilderness? They started judging and criticizing the very person who did that. It was God's grace that flowed through a bunch of individuals who in one way were unbelievably brilliant, in another way incredibly carnal. And through them, America was built. Extraordinary. They're in the upper room, the 12 disciples. It's so funny. Think about it. One minute, think about it, some of you who know the Bible, they literally came to Jesus and they said, Oh, the mother came to Jesus of James and John. Uh, Jesus, a moment of your time. Is there any way that my sons James and John, because if no one asks, then really, you know, you don't get it. Is it possible they could sit at your right hand and your left in the kingdom? Jesus slapped her and said, no, he didn't. <laughs> That's not for you, come on. He basically gently sets her straight. The same guy, Peter talking about, I don't care who comes against you. I don't care who comes. Not me. I don't know him. Shoot, he cursed. Judas took his own life because when he realized the truth, he couldn't handle it. These guys are now in the upper room. They're in the upper room. <laughs> that must have been one interesting meeting. Nobody's looking at each other. The women are all going, because they were the only ones who had guts. And that's true. In this case, it was true, if you read the Bible. <laughs> it shows no woman running in the woods, no woman backing down. They went right to the brink. They're all, the guys were all kind of shifting their feet and, that must have been it. Ten days, the Bible says. Ten days in the upper room. Can you imagine day two? And I can just imagine. I'm imagining this. There's no scripture for this directly. Old Peter. Guys, you know, day one, he's talking about excuses. Well, you don't understand the pressure I was under, man. You know, 
Y'all were whatever. And I was a lead guy and I had a lot of pressure on me. Another one doubting Thomas. Well, I didn't believe him anyway. I, 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 didn't, I didn't buy into the whole, the whole time. I, I knew there was something wrong with him. Anybody who wears a collar on cowboy boots can't be right. <laughs> Matthew's like, you know how much money I lost for my tax collecting business? Day two gets a little bit more real. Day three, day four, somewhere along the line, I just, can, I just got this wonderful imagination that's probably messed up too. And I can imagine just Peter going, you know what? I got a confession to make. I got a confession to make. And he breaks down, man, and he just starts. I denied him. I don't know how or why. I can't get the images out of my mind. And at that moment, the entire future of the church hung in how that little group treated him. Do we finish him off? Or do we honor his brokenness? Do we love on him because we weren't any better? Do we get him through this? And they came together and got each other through. And God said, that's all I need to pour out my spirit upon the earth. When he poured out his spirit upon that attitude and that mindset, they changed literally the known world. Bow your heads. While your heads are bowed, there's always a couple who struggle because some of the things we're speaking might be difficult. I want you to know something in this church and in this pulpit we stand by and honor God's word right is right and wrong is wrong and sometimes we're not sure there is sin there is disobedience I don't believe in condoning anything that God does not encourage in our lives sometimes people need to leave our lives it's just better that way there are some times when we need to talk about a bad that has gone on and deal with it. There are times we must keep a person away from our children and still love them and forgive them. I'm not throwing out here some blanket little theology that doesn't apply to real life. But what I am saying to you is, please, first of all, Will you please forgive yourself? Because if you don't, you will always judge other people very quickly. And please know who you are, but then start shifting to knowing who he is in you. And if he's not in you, then ask Jesus to come into your heart. We'll help explain this mystery and this magical, wonderful experience of transformation. But for now, just open your heart. And if you need to ask Jesus into your heart, I want you to just lift your hand. Let me see it. Just let me see it. Just you and me right now. Yes, yes, I see the hand. Yes, I see that hand. Anyone else? See? Yes, yes, I see that hand in the back there. I see your hands. I'm not certainly, yes, I see your hand. There's no desire here whatsoever to single you out, but you know what? It would be a pretty awesome day if this became your declaration of independence from the old life and a new declaration of dependence upon God. I would like us all to stand together. And what I'm going to ask you to do, if you raise your hand, I'm going to dismiss folks in a moment, okay? 
we have ministry people down here do this you don't have to do anything but I'm gonna encourage you to do this just come down here pray with one of them say I want to I want to ask Jesus in my heart let them pray with you you know the Bible says that if you believe in your heart you need to confess with your mouth you know if you want to get married to someone you wouldn't hide that fact you would want people to know start right here in a safe place and come on down I saw a number of hands here and we'll pray with you okay and for the rest of us church just know that God is growing us up and preparing us for the days ahead I can feel it can't you sense what he's doing it's powerful it's wonderful and we're all in this thing together amen amen father we go in peace and we pray that you will work in us yes but quickly shift the gears to work through us love them through us help them through us and help us have the patience sometimes to deal with those difficult ones father we thank you so much for teaching us and encouraging us we thank you for each other and for your presence in this house in Jesus' name, amen and amen.